A funeral mass is being held this hour for Bishop David O'Connell, who was killed in his Hacienda Heights home. This is a live look inside the service at the Cathedral of Our Lady of the Angels in downtown LA. The sanctuary is filled to capacity as people from across the Southland are gathered to honor his life. Therefore, Archbishop Lord, Jose Gomez is presiding over the mass. Cardinal Roger Mahoney delivered the homily. Bishop O'Connell was well known for his work on social justice issues and his support of immigrants. He administered to the community from gang members to the impoverished, as well as city leaders and law enforcement. And he just knew you. He knew your heart and he shared his. And it's one of the deepest tragedies I've ever experienced to lose him and to not have his presence here in Los Angeles. But I know he's, his wings are soaring above us. I met him more than 20 years ago as a, as a young captain in the, in the Rampart area, and I knew immediately in talking with him, plain spoken, down to earth, his heart was about the people. It was also about our law enforcement, our men and women who go out and do the job that they do, the sacrifices they make, and we don't always get it right. But he had a heart of compassion and empathy for them. He worried about them as much as he worried about anyone else, and, and he, that's why I think he was such an effective bridge builder. Should we pray, O oh Lord? Advance the peace. And the bishop was 69. His housekeeper's husband, who had also done handyman church. work for the bishop, Your is accused in his murder. Well, a group of LA County Sheriff's cadets involved in a horrific crash last year are graduating today. Assignment manager Mark Liu is at the desk, the hub of information as it comes into the newsroom. And Mark, you remember that morning all too well. Yeah, Amy, you know, that was one of the very first breaking news stories that we covered when we debuted this desk segment last year. A group of sheriff's cadets on a run were hit by an out of, out of control car. Now those cadets are graduating today. Let me show you video from back when it originally happened to remind you of what this was all about. This is video from November 16th of last year. You're looking at the scene of a horrific car crash where a driver plowed into a group of law enforcement cadets on a training run. 25 of them were injured, five of them critically. They were all from the STARS Center Training Academy, a facility that trains young people for a career in law enforcement. They were out practicing for an upcoming run and the driver who hit them, a man named Nicholas Gutierrez, says he fell asleep at the wheel and that's what caused that crash. He has never been prosecuted for this accident. Now, all of the cadets involved in this accident survived. Let me show you video of these cadets today. This is the Academy Class 464. Here they are at the auditorium at East LA College. Sheriff Robert Luna was there to help them graduate and get their certification. In total, 56 cadets graduated. It's a group of 10 women and 46 men. They're all ready to go on to careers in law enforcement. Some of them will join the Los Angeles Sheriff's Department. Others will join other various police agencies around Southern California. But it is a remarkable story of the will to continue on and survive and complete what they wanted to do and train to be law enforcement officers. Our reporter Jeff Newen covered that graduation ceremony today in its entirety. He's going to have that story later today, including reaction from those cadets and their families. It's going to be a really good one. Stick around. You'll want to see it. That is the very latest here from the desk. Amy, I'm going to send it back to you. And it's so amazing to see that all of those injured cadets graduated today. Thanks yep. so much, Mark. Well, gas prices are up again. They've been on the rise for nearly a month. KCAL News reporter Tina Patel has a look at where they stand and how you can save some money. A year ago, gas prices were going up because Russia had just invaded Ukraine. Now we are seeing high prices again, but the reason isn't quite as clear. Here in Valley Village, there are several stations charging more than $5 for a gallon of regular. The average price locally isn't quite that high, but it has been rising steadily over the last month. It's now up to $4.91 in LA County, slightly less in Ventura and Orange Counties. 482 is the average in the Inland Empire. That is much less than the $6 prices we were paying back in October. We're no longer breaking records, but drivers were hoping prices would stay low until California switched back to the summer blend of gas. Unfortunately, there's an inventory issue right now across the West Coast. Some refineries had breakdowns at the same time that others had scheduled maintenance issues. Experts are hoping repairs will be made soon and prices will stabilize. In the meantime, we asked one woman how she's adapting. Well, I have to plan my day. You know, if I'm going to the same location to do something, I try to plan plan how I'm doing things. You know, try to do this, you know, like two or three things close to the same location. 
Experts say that's what they advise, combining trips so people aren't driving as much. They also say proper vehicle maintenance is huge. They say just making sure your tires are inflated can get you help you get the most out of your gas. In Valley Village, Tina Patel, KCAL News. Well, a stunning exchange in a South Carolina courtroom after the judge hands down the sentence for convicted murderer Alex Murrah. Plus... Wow, stunning video out of Baltimore. The end of a police chase leads to a building collapse. Now the officers involved could be facing charges. Plus nature at its most primal. What one fisherman is saying about this feeding frenzy caught on camera. <laughs> and that storm system that passed through here is now wreaking havoc on the rest of the country, leaving devastation in its wake. This hailstorm may look all too familiar to plenty of us, and that's because the storm that just left here is now heading across the country. This video was shot in Texas yesterday, and that weather system moves east. Several tornadoes tore through Texas and Louisiana overnight, leaving hundreds of thousands of homes and businesses without power. This was a scene in Shreveport, Louisiana this morning, where rescue crews are hard at work. Less than 24 hours after a South Carolina jury convicted him of murdering his wife and 22-year-old son, disgraced attorney Alex Murdoch learned his fate. But before his sentencing, he spoke in court. Then the judge responded. But I'm innocent. I would never, under any circumstances, hurt my wife Maggie. And I would never, under any circumstances, hurt my son Paul Paul. Well, and it might not have been you. It might have been uh, the monster you become when you uh, take 15, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60 opioid pills. Well, the judge added that the disgraced lawyer who has admitted to stealing millions from his clients and firm lacked credibility. Yesterday, jurors came to a decision in less than three hours after closing arguments wrapped up in the six-week-long trial. They found Murdoch guilty of killing his wife, Maggie, and son, Paul, in addition to two counts of possessing a weapon during the commission of a violent crime. Today, the judge handed down his sentence. For the murder of Paul Murdoch. whom you probably love so much. I sentence you to prison for murdering him for the rest of your natural life. 
Murdaugh also received a life sentence for the murder of his wife. Those uh, sentences will run concurrently. Murdaugh now faces multiple charges for alleged financial crimes, including stealing millions from his clients and firm, some of which he admitted to during the trial. Well, newly released video shows a stolen car police chase that ended with a crash and a building collapse. Now, this all happened in Baltimore last month. The driver of the suspected stolen car sped off as officers approached it. The suspect's car then crashed into an innocent driver, careened into a pedestrian, killing that person, and then hit the building, causing it to collapse. Body camera video caught the moments just after that building came crashing down. Maryland's attorney general says an officer was told to end their pursuit shortly before the crash happened. The officer's actions that night are being investigated and they could face prosecution. The suspect behind the wheel was charged with stealing that car. There we go, buddy. Right. Here, bud. Here, someone hold the light. Got you. Come on, buddy. Hey, bud. You're doing it. You're doing it. You're doing it. Deputies in Martin County, Florida, raced in to save a man from a car that had crashed into a canal there after that driver says he swerved to miss a wild hog. Now, the driver's cell phone sent an alert with his location. Deputies say they know there are gators in that water, but went in to help regardless. That driver was taken to the hospital and is expected to recover. Well, check out this scene in the water off the coast of Venice, Louisiana. A group of fishermen looking for yellowfin tuna came across a group of sharks in a feeding frenzy. According to the fishermen who posted the video, the sharks were feasting on a pod of small fish. He went to say, he went on to say rather that he's never seen anything like it. it should be a pretty nice weekend to go fishing off the coast around yeah, here. Hopefully, not around a school of sharks. What's that? Hopefully not around a school of sharks <laughs> like that. Wow. Yeah, pretty incredible, right? That was that was pretty that was pretty insane. Yes, it'll be a decent weekend to get outside better than we have been recently. We're not going to win any awards for sunshine or warm weather, but the storms are gone hour by hour this afternoon. This is the nicest weather we'll get for the next four or five days. Low to mid 60s sunshine across the board and clear skies for a Friday evening. Still a little bit brisk. We have clear skies today. That storm system is going to pass by to our north. We may get an errant shower or two anytime from Saturday night through Sunday night. It's not going to amount to much. It's not going to be a flooding problem, but we will go cloudier on Saturday. We'll be chilly on Sunday mid afternoon, only 54 degrees with some showers and rain just to our north. It will be a big time problem for central and northern California. This storm misses us to the north. Just a slight chance of a shower on Sunday. 60s today, 60 degrees tomorrow, only 59 on Sunday before temperatures rebound by the middle of the next week. That's your metro forecast. For our valleys, we'll be a few degrees cooler down to 55 on Sunday. Mostly cloudy skies, could be a few showers. Inland Empire, you could see a few showers in the afternoon, rebounding to 60 by Wednesday. High desert, rough weather is calming down. You're not going to be warm. You're only going to hit 49 on Sunday, but we will rebound back to the mid 50s by the middle of next week. None of this is even back to normal. We're close, but not back to normal. Beaches, 55 on Sunday, but pleasant today and tomorrow. You may need a long sleeve uh, shirt or a sweatshirt. And the mountains, there's a chance of some snow showers on Sunday. 40s for highs today. That's your forecast. Amy, back to you. All right, Paul, thanks so much. Let's get a live look outside at LAX, where the airport is getting $50 million in funds for more renovations. This time, the money will go toward repaving and reconfiguring the roads in front of the terminals. Congressman Adam Schiff of Burbank says the project will also modernize the entrance to the central terminal parking area. Burbank Airport is also getting some funds. It received a $30 million grant to help with construction of a new 14-gate terminal building there. Four, three, two, one. Engines full power and lift off of Crew 6. Go Dragon, go Falcon. A blast off of a SpaceX Falcon 9 rocket from Vandenberg Space Force Base. It successfully boosted 51 more internet relay satellites into orbit. That means better internet connections around the world are on the way. This is SpaceX's 76 successful launch, primarily dedicated to the commercial global broadband network, Starlink.
Well, that's a mouthful. All right, more colorectal cancer being picked up at advanced stages and rates are increasing among younger people. We have some sobering news from the American Cancer Society. Up next, we're joined by a parent and a doctor, both with unique perspective on the disease, to share their thoughts on colon cancer awareness and prevention. Well, a new report from the American Cancer Society anticipates 153,000 new colorectal cancer cases this year and about 52,000 deaths. 60% of new cases are actually advanced stage disease and rates are increasing among younger people. Joining us now is Michael Frierson, who tragically lost his son to the disease, and Dr. Zuri Morrell, a colorectal surgeon here in LA. Thank you so much for joining us. It's certainly appreciate you both taking the time. I know, doctor, you had surgery, so we appreciate you <laughs> leaving there and rushing no here worries. for us, but we feel no like worries. it's such an important topic. Um, Michael, if you could first tell us a little bit about your son. Uh, first of all, I want to thank you for having us. Uh, this is a very important subject that we need to discuss and to talk about Michael. I'm, I can't, can't say enough th good things about him. I mean, just one of, the, one of probably the most wonderful people that you'd ever want to meet. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Sadly, though, he was diagnosed at 32, long before we're told that we should get colonoscopy. Yeah. So how did you find out what was really happening? Uh, we were working out one day, and uh, you know, he was dating uh, this young lady, and he kind of felt he was out of shape. So he we started working out on the beach. He couldn't run 10 yards. Wow. And so uh, we, I, when I saw that, I said, we need to do something about it. We need to get this checked. So uh, when he went and got checked by a physician, they found out that his blood levels weren't sustainable enough for, t to sustain life for a man his age. Mm -hmm. And then we went through the process of trying to figure out what it was. But it took a while before he actually got a colonoscopy. Yeah, I mean, a colonoscopy was the last thing they did yeah. to Michael. I mean, they tested him for leukemia before they tested yeah. him for colon cancer. Mm -hmm. So it was absolutely the last thing that they did. And when they tested him, uh, when he had a colonoscopy done, yeah, they finally had all these polyps in his colon. Wow. And, and I think what's interesting, uh, doctor, is that a lot of people, myself yeah. included, didn't realize that if you have a polyp yes. found, yes. that that will turn into cancer. Yes. So 
Um, there's two types of polyps. Mm -hmm. They're the adenomatous polyps, hyperplastic polyps. Adenomatous polyps are the ones that turn into cancer. And really what's so powerful about the colonoscopy is I always tell people it's not done to find cancer. Mm -hmm. It's the only test a man or woman can have that actually prevents cancer. Because the polyps turn, can turn into cancer, you actually remove a polyp during the colonoscopy. And that's what makes this test so important and, and so powerful. It's the only one that actually prevents cancer. Well, I know at one point you were supposed to get a colonoscopy at age 50. Now right. it's been lowered to 45. But yes. in your opinion, does it need to go down even lower? You know, uh, in my opinion, it does. But a lot of things, you know, as everything with this with this country is that it has to be a cost benefit, right? Mm -hmm. So what I think is even more important is knowing things that you can do to prevent it, but also knowing the signs and symptoms that will then prompt your physician mm -hmm. to get you a colonoscopy. And as part of that, um, if, if a parent has polyps then uh, their child question. should then yeah. have a colonoscopy earlier yes so the key really is a uh, family history is huge i always mm -hmm. say that when you're at the dinner table mm -hmm. that's when you can really influence whether or not not only you get a colonoscopy but whether or not you get cancer by what you put in your mouth mm -hmm. so if you have a family member who's had 10 or more polyps mm -hmm. like my father mm -hmm. he had that so i knew to get a colonoscopy earlier and i pretty much follow you know a pretty healthy lifestyle but even me, I'm 48 years old, but when I was 42, I had my colonoscopy early because my dad had a lot of polyps and I had a very large two centimeter polyp on the right side of my colon that would have never been found unless I had a colonoscopy and I would have had colon cancer. But it's important to know not only your family history, but signs and symptoms of colon cancer. Rectal bleeding, okay, blood mixed in the stool, changes in bowel habits, abdominal pain. Those things are very common so that does, that does mean that you probably don't have cancer. Mm -hmm. However, persistent uh, symptoms that aren't getting better with over-the-counter treatment or other treatment, you need to be evaluated by a physician no matter how old you are. Mm -hmm. And Michael, you are going to Washington to march. You want to eradicate colon cancer. How, I do. How, how can that happen? Well, look, you know, first of all, my big push <clears throat> with this thing is that we really need to start paying attention to this with younger people. Yes. We were just on a conference call last night in Zurich, part of this, with a bunch of young people talking, talking about the significance of this yes. and to hear their response to it. They're concerned about it. Mm -hmm. So the big thing with this, co this uh, going to Washington, D.C., is trying to get the Congress people and the senators yes. to pay attention to this mm -hmm. because we should reduce the age of when a person gets a colonoscopy. We should be doing colonoscopies, at, I say, at age 30, mm -hmm. you know, because if we start that screening process right now, mm -hmm. and if we started screening people between the ages of 25 and 40, colon cancer yeah. probably wouldn't exist in 15, 20 years. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. And you never even recommended it to your son because you just thought too yeah. early. Well, you want to know this is the crazy thing about this, and this is why the information is so important. This is why I'm talking to Zuri on a regular basis. The information is so important to get out to these young people so yes. that they can be advocates for themselves. Exactly. I mean, they. I, if, if I had known this when my sons were like 25, yeah. this wouldn't have been a problem for me because yeah. it wouldn't have been a financial issue. Now, my goal is to try not to make it a financial issue for, for anybody, anybody mm -hmm. right. under the age of 40 years old. Right. And you're trying to start a nonprofit to pay for that so people can yeah. go get that. I'm trying to raise $200 million. If I can raise $200 million, that means between 58,000 to 85,000 young people under the age of 40 would mm -hmm. not have to be concerned about paying for, co paying for a colonoscopy. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right. And one, one thing that I think is really important for young people, if you were born in 1990, you have a two times higher chance of getting colon cancer and a four times higher chance of getting rectal cancer than if you were born in the 1950s. Wow. And that is a huge statistic. Mm -hmm. And that is something that should prompt younger people to not only know their bodies, pay attention to their bodies, learn their family history, mm -hmm. but also pursue a colonoscopy if needed. Oh, we're out of time. I'm so curious about why at you're being born at 90. Yeah. Well, because we're seeing a big push in mm -hmm. terms of younger people getting colon cancer. And if you were born in 1955, you're over the age of 75. Okay. And that is, you know, where we used to see a higher rate, mm -hmm. but that's going down. Mm -hmm. Young people going up. Mm -hmm. There's multiple reasons. Hopefully we'll get a chance to talk about that one yeah. day. This is and no you think a lot of it is diet? Disease. Well, yeah, a lot of it is diet. So, uh, uh, highly processed foods. 75% mm -hmm. of the diet of 18 year olds and younger, mm -hmm. what we feed our kids is high processed foods. This creates an inflammatory condition in your body that makes it ripe for cancer, mm -hmm. along with obesity, along with a um, diet that is lower in fruits and vegetables. So these are tangible things that we can do. Vitamin D, 
taking vitamin D. We have uh, low vitamin D levels in this country, taking vitamin D. So I always say that you could be your own healthcare advocate. There's things you can do to decrease your risk, but if you have any of these changes, know your body, seek help. All right. Thank you both for joining us. We certainly appreciate it. Important Thank information. You. And uh, certainly you can find more information uh, on our website, KCAL9, KCALnews.com. All right. Yes. Well, maybe they should have named her Jackie Frost. Up next, a story of a mom who went into labor during a blizzard in our mountains. But she has another special name. And we are following breaking news. Los Angeles Sheriff's deputies are at the end of a high-speed pursuit. Assignment manager Mark Liu, live at the desk, our hub for breaking news. Mark, this has been pretty wild. Yeah, Amy, so this pursuit, it's currently stopped, but that driver has not given up yet. Let me take you out to live pictures from SkyCal. Okay, so this is in South LA, right near the intersection of Century and Main. That white Lincoln Navigator you see at the center of your screen, that was the vehicle that was fleeing from Los Angeles Sheriff's deputies. Now, you're not going to believe why they're chasing this guy. I heard this. The crime broadcast when this pursuit started. They say just a little while ago, about 30 minutes ago, the driver of this white Lincoln Navigator walked into the Los Angeles Sheriff's Century Station near Alameda and the 105 and walked in with a gas can, walked into the lobby, up to the desk, and tried to light the Century Station on fire. Now, they were able to stop him, but then he ran out, got into the Lincoln Navigator, and took off. There, that's when Los Angeles Sheriff's deputies went in pursuit. They say he was driving very, very recklessly. At one point, he attempted to ram one of their patrol cars, but did not make contact, so there was no damage. But this pursuit went on. He was driving very recklessly and now has ended here, right in South LA, as I said, near Main and Century Boulevard. That driver is still inside the car. Now, if you look on the right side of your screen, you can see what look like skid marks. To me, Amy, that says they may have done a pit maneuver here to get this vehicle to come to an end. Now, it's possible that that vehicle is disabled. Sometimes pit 
maneuvers can destroy the transmission uh, in you know during a pit maneuver because the car rolls backwards. Other times, more modern vehicles they can handle that, especially if the driver is able to put the car into neutral or able to you know work with that spin so it doesn't disable the car. But we have not seen any movement so far. You can see Los Angeles sheriff's deputies with their guns drawn in the ready position. They are very likely calling this driver out. But right now, Amy, I have not seen any movement from inside that car at all. So it's sort of a standoff right now here. The street is closed and a very dangerous situation, but wild that this is an arson suspect. We have usually not seen pursuits involving an arson suspect for some time. Well, and the fact that he was willing to set the sheriff's station on fire, they know that this person is very dangerous and willing to do just about anything. Mark, I'm trying to understand exactly what is on the hood of the Lincoln Navigator there, right you know for what? the drivers? Yeah, I, I was wondering that too. I saw SkyCal, they did a digital zoom and pushed in very, very tight. It looks like a box of some kind, but I'm not exactly sure how it could have gotten there. I can't imagine that a parcel that size would stay on the hood during a pursuit. So I don't know if the driver put that there or there's something else going on there. We just, we, SkyCal just got overhead. We don't actually have any video of the actual pursuit. So I'm, I'm curious too as to what that is. I have not heard any radio traffic about what that is on the hood, but it is curious. Now, as you can see here, they're sort of in the ready position they're obviously calling this driver out. I mean, they, they want this person to surrender, but we haven't seen any movement from this car, and the street is closed right now. Um, and I did hear radio traffic indicating that there was really no significant damage at the sheriff's station, so it seems like this arson didn't get too far. That's good, but they do want to take this person into custody. We're going to keep SkyCal overhead and bring you any developments if this continues or this driver surrenders. Until then, Amy, I'm going to send it back to you. All right, Mark, and of course, we're going to continue to monitor this and bring you any updates as we receive them. All right, a couple in the mountains got caught in last week's storm, which would have been, you know, somewhat fine, except they were having a baby. Last Thursday night, Crystal Wade started having contractions, but she and husband Brady were in Lake Arrowhead and the roads were, they just weren't plowed. They, they set out to get to the hospital in Fontana and after an hour on the road, they got to the hospital just in time. Soon after, baby Winter was born. Having contractions with the bumpy road made it so much more intense. And I was telling him, I was like, we might have to have this in the truck. Please run the red lights. But it's not like we could go fast because the highways weren't plowed and it was very dangerous conditions. Oh, Winter is doing just fine. What a cutie there. The Wades also have a little boy named Brayden who says he always wanted a baby sister. All right, let's get a live look outside now where it's another calm day across the Southland. Just a few clouds, but at least nothing falling from the sky. We want to check back in with meteorologist Paul Deano for your next weather forecast. And of course, we're talking about rain and snow falling from the sky. Yes, thankfully. Thankfully, we're getting a break. We had a lot, arguably too much in too short of a time. So needed to call time out on that. Mother Nature thankfully obliged. Pleasant day outside downtown Los Angeles, 59 degrees. Hey, our second straight day will make it into the 60s. We'll do it again tomorrow right at 60 degrees. So we'll at 60 for a few minutes. There is nothing falling from the sky. Why? Because we have a device that's looking out and sending out a signal. And if it hits something and it bounces back, uh, most of the time that is rain or snow. Nothing right now. How about this? Snowpack, California, Nevada, and Arizona, close to 200% of average or double what normally we would have. California is running 92% above average. Nevada, 204% of average. Arizona, 210% of average. Not just us. It's the whole southwestern U.S. has been really wet and really snowy so far this winter. Downtown Los Angeles, mid-60s today. Burbank, 63. Victorville, 56. Santa Ana, 61. And Riverside and Temecula, 60 degrees for a high today. So. 11 straight days cooler than average. That streak continues. It's likely going to go at least another week. 19 of the past 21 days have been colder than average. When do we warm up? We'll take a look at the long range forecast coming up in a couple minutes. All right, Paul, thanks so much. What's well, a special way to teach kids that doesn't just focus on academics? Some of the, the effects of the impacts of the pandemic are actually not really coming up until recently. Up next, our Kids in Crisis series focuses on solutions.
Well, we are continuing our Kids in Crisis series now by taking a look at some of the youngest members of our community who are struggling with their mental health. Our Kalina Estrina shows us how one school is searching for a solution to help them with a unique approach. Deep breath in, nice and tall. And let's do our bubble breathing out. The pandemic affected everyone. The uncertainty and anxiety of quarantine took a mental toll. Alyssa Arroyo is a second grade teacher at Valor Academy in Arleta. She says not even the youngest are spared. Some of the, the effects of the impacts of the pandemic are actually not really coming up until recently. We're seeing that more now. And so we're noticing like a lot of more emotional needs and a lot of um, support that students need in that area. You may ask how some of these students, some of which are in TK and were just one when the pandemic started, were affected. During the pandemic, a lot of the kids were taught to stay away from each other, having distance, um, and then coming back from the pandemic, they just didn't have the social skills and the processing of how do we handle emotions. So the educators at this public charter school turned to a social learning curriculum, which is guided by the Yale Center for Emotional Intelligence Ruler Program, an acronym for five skills of emotional intelligence, recognizing, understanding, labeling, expressing, and regulating. In the morning when they come in, they start with a morning circle, and it's our family time, where they're able to, they're able to come in, do a mood meter check, and just on how they're feeling. Um, and then after each break, they're able to do mindful breathing. We need to calm our body. There's even a calm corner in each classroom where the students can step away from their schoolwork when it gets to be too much. And sometimes it can take two minutes for um, a younger kid to get distracted, and sometimes it might take um, an older student like five minutes. But does it work? We asked eight-year-old David Roman Peralta. I like to do the hot cocoa breathing. When I'm sad, it helps me. When I'm mad, it helps me. It helps me, with, it helps me a lot. Diego Martinez agrees. He says it even helps him at home. When I like, feel angry or my sisters, they like bother me a lot. Mom, I'm gonna be in my room for like a couple of minutes, maybe for like 20 or like 30 minutes and watch some TV and wait till like I calm myself down with the breathing sometimes. And psychologists agree. Children with emotional intelligence are more likely to be successful in the future. Uh, especially in the community that we live in, um, being a person of color, we're not really always as free uh, culturally in the past to express our emotions. And now our kids are able to, and they're able to be their best selves. Well, if you or someone you know is in crisis, remember there is help available like the National Suicide and Crisis Lifeline. You can call or text 988. And we have posted more resources available to help young people struggling with their mental health on kcalnews.com. Go to our website and look for the Kids in Crisis section. Well, it's green, it's slippery, and downright gross. Yet every kid in America loves it. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. Ah! <laughs> we are talking about slime, of course. And up next, our entertainment reporter, Suzanne Marquez, joins us to explain how it became the staple of the Nickelodeon Kids' Choice Awards.
This is what they said to do. Oh, in honor of this weekend's Nickelodeon Kids Choice Awards, CBS This Morning took one for the team getting slimed on air. Now, we all know kids love slime, but where did dumping it on people's heads get its start? For that answer, we turn to our entertainment reporter, Suzanne Marquez, who herself was just recently slimed. And how was it, Suzanne? Okay, well, Amy, we have to also add, you've been slimed before, too. No, 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 no. I was talking about the when slime came out. Oh, yeah. I remember getting oh, my first little... Oh, with it. Oh, yes. you didn't actually get it on your oh, head. Oh, no. No, okay. no, no. And I see why, because once you do it, <laughs> You're done, but it was a dream come true. Who doesn't want to get slimed at least once in their lifetime? And this year, prepare to see more people slime than ever. A thousand people were slimed just last year at the Nickelodeon Kids' Choice Awards. It's a tradition that dates back decades. Jill D wants an epic, totally annihilated. At the Kids' Choice Awards, no one is safe from being slimed. Watch your step, Charlie Puth. Mr. Beast, you too. Dixie D'Amelio, thank you. Audience, you too. Let's take a look back to how it all began. It started in 1979 with the show You Can't Do That on Television, featuring the great green gelatinous goop. A sketch with a kid locked up in jail, and when he pulls his shackles, he got slimed. It was a hit, and it was also a mess, so kids got paid up to 50 bucks for every slime, which is a lot of green. Wondering what it's made of? You'll just have to keep guessing. After you can't do that on television, Nickelodeon became the place for slime. With Double Dare, Wild and Crazy Kids, Figure It Out, Slime Time Live, Brain Surge, Webheads, and then everywhere. Toys, shampoo, furniture, cereal. Nickelodeon Studios even had a geyser spewing the goo every 15 minutes. But the ultimate sliming happened at the Kids' Choice Awards. Once celebs started appearing on stage and getting slimed, it made it even cooler to look like this. Who are we gonna slime? Really? You don't know who? Slime. Nate, CBS Morning's co-anchors decided to get into the spirit. We are ready for a little slime time in the studio. Viewers voted on social media to decide who Gail King would slime. The options are the very handsome Tony DeCopo, Vlad Dutier, the okay new dad, new dad. <laughs> Just okay. This is our senior producer, Matt Shelley, and this is the lovely Jerika Duncan. Matt Shelley, have you been rallying all of your friends? Every single person I know. With more than 40% of the vote, Matt Shelley was the winner. Yeah. Oh, oh, this is nasty. Oh. What does that feel like, Matt? Fine. And it turned out his coworkers were not spared. I brought some backup with me. I'm going to step out of the shot. Backup? What do you mean backup? Backup. Let's go, backup. Let's go. <laughs> yeah, so it's fun. And I was always curious what it tastes like. So I tasted it right after I got slimed. It tastes very much like cornstarch, which I expected because it's a thickening agent. But other than that, it was just cold and goopy. But it was fun. I bet it was. <laughs> All right. Thanks so much, Suzanne. And of course, you can check out Suzanne tonight on the latest edition of her show, The Lot. She's talking to Michael B. Jordan about Creed 3. She's taking us behind the scenes of the production of The Lion King in the Pantages Theater and Tom Cruise's connection to it. It's all streaming at uh, 7 p.m. on CBS Los Angeles, Pluto TV, Channel 405, and the KCAL News app. Coming up next, Paul Deano is back with a check on your next weather forecast. And we're going to check back in on the end of that pursuit and standoff happening right now in South L.A.
And we want to continue following that breaking news. Los Angeles Sheriff's deputies are at the end of a pursuit with a driver who refuses to give up. Simon Manager Mark Liu live at the desk where we're tracking this breaking news live. Mark, there's been a little update for us. Yeah, that's right. This is now basically a barricade situation. SkyCal is overhead right now. I want to show you in the center of your screen that white Lincoln Navigator. That is the vehicle that Sheriff's deputies were in pursuit of. They wanted this driver for arson. Basically, the report is that the driver of this vehicle walked into the Los Angeles Sheriff's Station uh, at Century Division, right by Alameda and the 105, with a gas can and tried to light the lobby on fire. Then the guy ran out to his car and took off. LA Sheriff's deputies went into pursuit. There was a short pursuit up to the north, and it ended here at Maine and 107th when they did a pit maneuver on that White and Lincoln Navigator. You see it spun the opposite direction. They believe the vehicle is disabled, but they're not taking any chances. They have put spike strips in the area around here. I don't think this driver is going to be able to get out of here driving away because there's also an armored unit that is now on scene. The sheriffs have called, sheriff's deputies have called in their armored Bearcat unit to come in. They're going to, there it is. You can see it right there. It is going to approach from behind. It is going to box this driver in. Now they have seen this driver inside moving from the back seat to the passenger seat, back to the driver's seat. He's rolled down the window. He's peeked his head out. They are giving him commands to surrender, but he is not complying. The other thing that we have learned, if you can look at the front of that Lincoln Navigator, you see what looks like a box on the front there. The Sheriff's Air Unit identifies it as a large piece of cinder block. They don't know why it's there, but it's been there since the start. We're going to keep SkyCal overhead and keep monitoring this if this driver surrenders. Until then, that is the very latest here from the desk. Amy, I'm going to send it back to you. All right. Thanks so much.